Welcome back to the Rose Bros Podcast. This episode, we are joined by John Brusa, partner and chair of the BDNP Law Firm. In addition to being known for co-creating the $100 billion energy income trust market, he's been a partner of BDNP since 1987. John Brusa obtained his Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Windsor in 1978 and a Bachelor of Laws degree with gold medal distinction from the University of Windsor in 1981. He articled with BDMP and was admitted to the Law Society of Alberta in June of 1982. He is also a board member of numerous companies including Cardinal Energy, Crew Energy, Crown Capital Partners, Sealcanth Energy, and Titanium Corporation. John also contributes his time to many organizations including the Haskins School of Business, Calgary's Committed to Change Cabinet, the Resolve Campaign, and the Calgary Homeless Foundation. We sat down for a smooth cup of Rose Bros coffee and discussed the story of how the energy income trusts were created and then destroyed, becoming a consigliere to business leaders, the importance of creating value for shareholders, and why it's important to bet against the crowd when you're right. Enjoy! Also, the full video of this episode is available on YouTube, so if you enjoyed the episode, check out the Rose Bros channel and subscribe. It'll go a long way to helping the show. Also... This week's podcast is brought to you by Rundle Eco Services. Looking for a way to recycle your frack pond and pit liners used in the energy industry? Rundle collects and processes liners using an environmentally friendly system, leaving a clean environmental footprint. The end use of these liners are shredded and processed into pellets that can be used and extruded into various forms of usable plastic products, including furniture, various building materials, and industrial packaging. Check out rundleco.com for more details on how you can recycle your industrial pond and pit liners today. Yeah. John Brusa. Hello. Hello. How are you this morning? I'm doing well. Good. Thank you very much for doing this. I I love having an opportunity to talk, so (laughs) you're doing me a favor. Officially, you are the chairman and partner of BD&P Law Firm. Mm -hmm. You are an advisor to many companies. You're also a big donor and charity. How would you describe yourself? Well, (laughs) that's that's a good question. I mean, I think, I think life's a bit of a journey and everything along the way kind of informs what you are. I, uh, I give you a little bit of background. My parents were Italian immigrants, uh, came in the post World War II era and uh, they actually went back and forth a couple of times. My dad did. And I was, my mother came back for the final time pregnant with me. So I'm a, I'm, I'm born in Canada. I'm a Canadian citizen. Can't deport me. But my parents were were both Italians. I had two older siblings who were also uh, born in Italy. And so, yeah, my dad was a a working class guy. He was a construction laborer. And uh, like a lot of immigrants, you know, you leave your home probably not necessarily for yourself, but to make sure your kids have better opportunities. My dad was all about that. He was... He really encouraged me to go to school and and, uh, and all of that. And, uh, yeah, and so I went to undergrad, Windsor. I kind of bounced around between the math program and economics and finally got a history degree and then woke up one day and said, what the hell am I going to do with that? So I went to law school, and uh, that took me to Calgary in 1981 and uh, to this firm. I've, I've only had one job in my my working career, my professional career. And uh, since then, I mean, this firm's kind of unique in this in the sense that it has a very strong entrepreneurial sp- uh, spirit. Also, encourages the lawyers to align themselves with the clients. Like we we try to adopt uh, an ethos, so we're on the client's side. It's not an adversarial, or it's not even a. You know, it's not like you're going to the to, to the doctor to get advice. We're on the same team. And so what happened was that, you know, I had an interest in business and I had interest in the oil business. I didn't know anything about it when I came out here. The joke was I didn't know the difference between oil and gas, which made a trip to the service station a little challenging. But I, I had some interesting clients and I was kind of the annoying little brother, young, and asking them questions about why you're doing this and why you're doing that. So had a chance to learn a lot about the guts of the business. And that one thing led to another and um, ended up on my first public board in 1990. And uh, last count, I've been on like 50 plus. 
And uh, since then, in a variety of businesses, uh, oil sands construction, uh, services, manufacturing, financial services, marketing, but mostly oil and gas production. So it's, it's given me a chance to sort of use my legal skills as a springboard to, to learn about the business and then to be a participant in the business. And so I think it makes me a better lawyer, made me a better lawyer. And, uh, I, you know, I thought what I brought to the business world uh, was informed by being a lawyer. So you know, it all kind of worked. So that's the, that's the, the long story in a nutshell. Would you consider yourself a lawyer or more of along the lines of a consigliere, kind of like the <laughs> godfather? <laughs> Robert Duvall's uh, Tom Hagen. Say, I was going to say, is that my Italian background? Yeah. Or, uh, that's very unwoke of you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I think that's right. I think I am, uh, when I sit on boards, you know, people say, well, do you give a lot of free legal advice? And the truth is I give very little. It's more, it's more, yeah, business advice. Sometimes it's personal advice. Sometimes people are going through divorces. Sometimes people, you know, who are business associates who have become friends, have kid issues and all the rest of it. So, yeah, consigliere is, is not a bad, is not a bad description. <laughs> I hadn't thought about it, but it's pretty good. Has anyone ever asked you that? Actually, someone actually did tell me that. <laughs> says, you're my consigliere. I just hadn't really thought about it. Um, <laughs> You know, what I really think about, like what I try to do is in business, you know, when you have a partnership, it should have the best elements of being a good friend. And, and, you know, the best elements of a good friend is they'll tell you when you're wrong. They support you when you're having a hard time. Uh, They don't take advantage of you. So, so I've always tried to, to have that as the standard. Of, of how I conduct myself in business. I mean, there's been some points where that was difficult because sometimes that runs up against your fiduciary duty as a director. Like, you know, say when the company's not performing and you got to fire the CEO, that is really tough. But in the end, you know, you, you've got to say, hey, my higher duty is to the shareholders. Yeah, I've tried to be a friend, and um, but but a friend also tells you when it's time to go. You know, it's kind of like, you know, your best friend's in an abusive relationship. Yep. Time to tell them to go. Yep. So, so yeah, no, that's that's what I've tried to do. You do it all the time. No, but, you know, what's uh, Shakespeare said, if man's reach is not to exceed his grasp, then what are dreams for? Yeah. So that's what you try to do. <laughs> you were the co-creator of the Energy Income Trusts. Mm-hmm. What were the Energy Income Trusts? Well, what, what you have to look at it in the context of what was happening in the business at the time. So if you think about Western Canada in the late 40s when Leduc, you know, the gusher at Leduc, it was a, a, a very underexplored basin. And a bunch of discoveries made through the 50s, 60s, 70s, early 80s. But, but the targets were getting smaller and smaller. And the bigger companies who dominated the basin were saying, this isn't really worth our while anymore. And uh, you also have to look at, so so that's what happens on the macro level. Then you have to look at particular properties. Like particular properties go through a life cycle. The early part of their life cycle, they require more capital than, than the cash flow they throw off. And during the latter part of their life cycle, it's the opposite. And if you keep throwing capital at an asset which is physically mature, you, you bump straight forward into the law of diminishing returns, right? And so that's what was happening. So you had big players exiting the basin. You had more and more of the properties were very mature. This was, you know, this was before the unconventional aspect of, of the basin. So, so, you know, the basin was kind of, if you looked at it from the early to mid eighties forward, if you're looking forward from that time, you'd say, this is a very mature basin and we're in harvest mode. You know, there's still stuff to do and there's still capital to be employed, but the ratio of capital to cash flow is, is skewed towards harvest, harvesting cash flow. So you had to have a vehicle to do that. And, and so what you're, what you're trying to do is saying, well, what's the, who, who in the world will pay the most 
for the cash flow from an oil and gas well. And the truth is mom and pop general public will because you were in a, a very low in, a low interest rate, low and dropping interest rate environment. You had lots of people that were on fixed income and they were saying, oh, my God, you know, how can I live on 2 percent GICs or 3 percent or 4 percent GICs when they'd been used to 8 or 9 or 10 percent. Right. So 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 it was just a bunch of factors that came together. It was big guys exiting the base and they wanted to sell out. They wanted to sell their properties, particularly the mature stuff. It was the mature stuff was starting to become more and more of what was going on in, in this space. And, and thirdly, you had an investing public who was starving for yield. So, you know, kind of uh, whatever the reverse of a perfect storm is, a perfect sunny day or whatever <laughs> for that. And, um, and so that was kind of the economic backdrop. But, you know, to everything, there's a human element. And, this, and this, the human element was this guy named Marcel Trombley, who was just this crazy guy from Montreal. Like I could, I could do a whole podcast on Marcel stories. And uh, I was asked to contribute to his obituary in the Globe. And Marcel, one of the lines I had about Marcel was, he was one of these guys that had like a thousand ideas in his head at any particular time, about two of which made sense. But the two were so original and cool. And so his idea was, hey, why don't we do this? And uh, what had happened was he had been fired by Royal Trust. And he was friends from Montreal, one of the lawyers here, who uh, at the time uh, we had moved into new office space, not this space, but we had moved into new office space. We had a bunch of spare offices. So the guy said, hey, why don't you, why don't you come and, and stay with us? And uh, Marcel did. And I was right down the hall. And I started talking to him. And I'm like, you know, I was about, I was 86. So I would have been late 20s, 28, 29, something like that, 85, 86. And, uh, and this idea sort of took shape. And I always say, really, it was Marcel's idea. I helped structure it in a way that was RSP eligible and all this other stuff. And it kind of worked from the tax side. But, you know, I, it was Marcel's idea. He was the mad scientist. I was the guy with the pipe wrench kind of, you know, <laughs> tightening the bolts and stuff like that. So, so it was a combination of economic factors So, and a guy, right guy, right time. Thing grew into a $100 billion industry. Was he on a run one day? Was he in the shower? And then kind of the idea just came up? I don't know. You know <laughs> he was like, he was one of these guys. Like, and if you ever talk to him... There was a lot of ideas that made zero sense. <laughs> like, I mean, zero <laughs> sense. And, and so, and, you know, he was just a, he was a bon vivant type guy. He was, you know, you're kind of quintessential French Canadian, uh, loved his wine, loved his fine food, loved corny jokes. I mean, it, he was just a different guy. And, and he had been kind, what he was doing at Royal Trust was he was buying, uh, mature oil and gas properties for pension funds. And th- his idea was, well, why can't we do this for the general public? Why can't we create a yield product? So, I mean, that was the big idea. The The trust really s- came out of that, which was how do you package that in a way that, you know, no liability for owning, you know, mom and pop doesn't want the liability of a blowout or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want it to be tax efficient. You want blah, 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 all these things. And, and so that was that. So his was the big idea. The structure was the structure. And then actually, I took it to the infamous, famous and infamous Jim Kinnear and said, Jim, you're, you're the quintessential promoter. This is a vehicle for you. And, and so that's how Pengrove got started. So literally the two biggest trusts, at the time and probably since then, Enterplus and Penrose started in these offices. And we did like the, the uh, ARC resources, which was another one. And at one point, this firm, one office, we had something like 60% of the trust index, the TSX trust index. And that's across all industries, you know, health, the, the Halifax uh, terminal, West short terms. We had, we had all kinds of, uh, Northwest company, which was a retail. So yeah. So, so out of great, out of small things, great things grow, but that, that's the story. Uh, right guy, right time. 
young guy helping him out. That's the story. <laughs> young, naive, impressionable guy helping him out. So that's the story. Did you guys have any idea what you were creating at the time? Zero. <laughs> Zero. Zero. It was funny because I, I became a real passionate defender of the idea because I think it made like tons of sense. In the end, when the conservative government shut it down, I had fairly heated discussions with Jim Flaherty the finance minister because, and, and Mark Carney actually, who was his sidekick at the time. And I said, you guys just don't understand this. And, and it, it's not a tax dodge. I mean, the, the truth was to the extent you're moving I income from corporations, which have about a 34% tax rate to an individual has a 50%, your tax yield goes up. And of course the tax yield did go down when they shut it down. And so I, I had these very heated discussions with Jim Flaherty and, you know, they teach a, a church not to say ill of the dead, but I have a hard time with that. I thought, I thought he didn't get it. And, and I thought Mark Carney was kind of duplicitous in all of this. And there was a bunch of people in the background who were arguing, you know, were whispering in their ears and uh, saying, this is terrible for Canada. And the truth was, it was it was very good for Canada. It repatriated a lot of assets out of foreign hands. It created tons of jobs, and so it was just one of those. It's kind of a there is there there was a bit of a tragedy to it that that something that was a sort of a made in Canada thing created so much value and so much wealth and so much income. You know, for for a lot of these mom and pop pensioners, they relied on this stuff. You know, for the government to shut it down was kind of crazy. There was excesses, but the market would have sorted them out. There was good trust, bad trust. Market would have sorted that out. So like one of the little, you know, I don't, I'm generally not a screamer, but one of the things my, my voice is kind of raising with Flaherty was saying, you know, for a conservative government, you're not letting the market sort this out. They're, you know, it's it's a good idea, but like everything, there's good aspects and bad, you know, there's good players and bad like players, and the market eventually sorts that out. And I said, you know, you guys are taking a very paternalistic view of shutting this all down on the basis of, I think, faulty. Yeah, in the end, he didn't like me. He was, I usually leaven my stuff with a sense of humor, so I, I try not to be offensive, but I think in the end, he really didn't like me at all. <laughs> For anyone that is listening, the Energy Income Trust basically allowed companies to pass on all their money to shareholders tax-free instead of being taxed by the government? No, no. That was the big misconception. What happened was it, it, it transferred the tax liability from the company to the recipient. And that was all it did. And because the recipient had a higher tax rate than the payer, it was actually... It, it produced more money for government. And, you know, uh, there was uh, there's a guy who at the time was an analyst with BMO, Gord Tate, who actually filed a, um, an access information request to get the calculations because it had been it had been uh, shut down on the basis that it was a tax dodge. And so he did an access to information and he got like 27 blank pages or something. And, and the truth was they had done no, they had done no background or anything on this. And, and, and truly the, the tax was never an issue for them. It was really because they were concerned that as more of the economy get, got held by these trusts, capital investment would collapse, not in the oil and gas sector. I had private conversations with the bureaucrats and they said we were never worried about the oil and gas trust. We were worried about telecom and, and some of these other tech industries that if they were forced to pay out all their cash flow, they wouldn't be reinvesting and productivity would collapse and all the rest of it. I mean, you know, Canada has a terrible rate of productivity anyway now, so I, I guess they were they were wrong and right, I guess. But, but yeah, no, it was, uh, that was the real reason that they, they, they did it wasn't because it was costing them any money. They, they came up with this tortured analysis of some $400 million of tax revenue, well, 400 million tax revenue is like 0.2% of the, you know, 
you're, you're shutting down a hundred billion dollar industry for 0.2 of a percent of your of your annual tax take. And even the 500 million was wrong. The only way they could get it was they would assume that money trapped in RSPs would never be taxed, which is kind of ridiculous because if you look at uh, RSPs um, in Canada, at least at the time, I haven't looked at the recent statistics, but they pay out quite a bit. Like people take money out of their RSPs to live. And, and when you take money out of your RSP, it's taxed. And, you know. So if they'd done a real honest calculation, they would have seen that income trusts were tax positive. They couldn't do that because they had to come up with a rationale that, that John Q. Public would accept, which is the trust sector or a bunch of t- tax cheats. And it wasn't true. And, and they knew it wasn't true. And so they did it for another reason. And, you know, whether that reason is stands up to stands up to scrutiny, you know, it's 15 years later, who knows? But um, it, it was it was kind of a it was a very cynical thing. And it was kind of maddening. It was a great idea. It grew into a large market. Investors made a ton of money. It really supported the local well, the national economy. But then. October 31st, 2006, oh. the Halloween Massacre. Right. What was the Halloween Massacre? Halloween Massacre was on October 31st, Jim Flaherty, after the markets closed, got up and said, we're closing down income trusts. There's quite a backstory there, which I can't, I can't fully reveal, but uh, I was advising on a rather large conversion of a corporation to a trust at the time, and we were sitting there doing the legal, the paperwork to announce it probably two weeks later. Probably the biggest, would have been one of the biggest. And, you know, there was other trusts being contemplated. Uh, BC was going to was gonna convert. And so it was, a, it was kind of an overheated time. B- bizarrely, uh, Harper had campaigned, you know, he'd been elected, what, about 12, 18 months before, campaigned on a, on a platform of leaving the trust alone. That was kind of weird. So cynical times. The end of the trust that day. And well, they gave a transition period, but it was, yeah, it was the end. It was the end. The market opened the next day. The trusts were trading 15 to 20% down. I think I read about $30 billion were erased. Yeah, was that's erased. about right. It was about $100 billion and $30 billion was destroyed overnight. And that's why when I say the $500 million a year, which is the wrong number, was, you know, like talk about using a sledgehammer to kill a flea. Do you remember what you were doing the moment you found out about that? <laughs> I was in that boardroom. I was advising the company. I was, I was brought in as a special consultant on the trust conversion. So I was there. And you read it on like the news. Yeah, someone walked in and uh, uh, somebody walked in and says, have you seen this? Ugh. And, and, you know, we couldn't believe it. You know, it was just a, um, you just couldn't believe that they had done this, especially after how they had campaigned. So. Critic in the public would say, how could you not know this was coming? Well, you, you didn't know because they had campaigned that they weren't going to shut down the trust. And so, you know, you were fairly, you know, you thought, well, literally they had, it had been part of their platform that that the liberals were going to kill the trust and we were going to save the trust because we were going to save the trust. So, you know, it wasn't crazy. <laughs> it wasn't crazy to think that. You had no idea this announcement was coming. Uh, no, I, I, I thought there might be some change to it. Like maybe, um, maybe some kind of a little tax change of sorts. But I, the, the idea of shutting down a hundred billion dollar uh, industry, uh, I mean, you know, Canada's not that big a country. hundred billion dollars, you know, adds up. In hindsight, do you think it was a mistake to shut it down? Or oh, absolutely. hundred percent. Have you changed your mind? hundred percent was the wrong idea. And, you know, if you, if, if, if the people involved were honest today, they would probably admit that. They should have been more selective. There were some aspects of the trust that they should have shut down. But the oil and gas was, you know, I mean, the interesting thing is 
we talk about wanting our tax system to be similar enough to the U.S. because it's a North American economy. And the U.S., what they did in 1987, so that's uh, 13, that's uh, 20 years before almost, Mm -hmm. they had shut down their version of the trust and they had exempted oil and gas in the States. Their version of the trust was something called the Master Limited Partnership. Don't those still exist in the U.S.? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And in real estate in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. So... They had uh, they had shut it down, and it was it was actually interesting. It was kind of for the same reasons to say that there were some businesses that were not appropriate for the trust structure, and uh, but but oil and gas and pipelines and things like that were because they're they're I mean especially uh, you know I mean the idea behind uh, the, the trust structure is it works as a way. To prevent capital from being wasted because you're you're not spending capital on a very mature asset and so you're just you know it, economically it's it's what you should do and uh in the u.s they figured that out and in canada uh for an, a bunch of reasons which are sort of political skullduggery which i won't go into they decided to use a broad brush and they shut them all down except for real estate trusts. Which doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. And um, <clears throat> there, you know, there, there are a lot of rumors as to why that happened and it um, involved a lot of, you know, some political skullduggery. Wow. So. Do you ever want to be CEO of an energy company and start no. your own? No. I've been asked. I think, you know, you have to know what your skill set is. And, uh, uh, you know, that's why Tom Hagen wasn't the Don <laughs> and the Godfather. <laughs> no, I think, I think that's, that's right. You, you know, I mean, I'm a great believer in knowing your own limitations and, and targeting yourself to what you do best. I mean, combination of it makes you happier yeah. and you do a better job. You know, it's the classic, the classic example is if I tried to fix my car, it would probably take me 12 hours. If I went to my mechanic, he'd probably do it in a half hour. Doing his tax return, it would take me a half hour, probably take him 12. You know, so, so why wouldn't you just do what you're good at and, 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 and contribute in a way that you, you can contribute? And, um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of running a company, you know, especially of size, is dealing with people. And dealing with, you know, their their ups and their downs and their aspirations and all the rest of it. And there's tons of people that are better at that than I am. Like I, I think I'm a good strategist. On on and I'm I, I think I'm pretty good on seeing the macro forces in the economy. Like you know we talked about the, the macro forces that that gave rise to the trust. I think I'm pretty good at that. For years, I ran the tax department here. My joke was I never wanted more than uh, nine people because I didn't think I could manage in double digits. <laughs> yeah. So, so you got to know what you're good at. In a way, BDMP is an entrepreneurial venture and kind of steering the ship and growing. Yeah, yeah but, you know, I'm, I'm the chairman and uh, I've never wanted to be the managing partner. And no one's ever asked me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, uh, but yeah, no, it, like... It, it, I've always thought that business, it's a bit like putting together a hockey team. Like, you know, no hockey team's going to work if you got, you know, 18 guys who are flashy scorers but won't back check. Well, it won't work if you got 18 guys that are all stay at home defensemen and no one can shoot the puck either. So, like, the key to all this is, is you know, shoring up your own personal weaknesses mm-hmm. by having the right people around you. And that's, that's kind of. Uh, I, I've sort of done that at BDP. I've done it in creating a tax department. Uh, I've, I've done it in business where you, you you try to put people together that, you know, there's, there's two aspects of it. One is they have complementary skills and then they respect each other. Because you don't want people, like like there are, there are some I've met in business who, you know, let's, I'll just give you an example. Say they're an engineer. Well, they don't have any respect for an accountant or they don't have any respect for the corporate lawyer because they say, wow, geez, you know, that's, that's irrelevant. Or, you know, the, one of the old oil patch, uh, uh, um, I don't know, not jokes, but 
sayings is, you know, the geologist going up to the, uh, the company account and saying, how many barrels of oil did you find today? Well, it's the wrong question, right? Right. It's not, not the right way to look at it. Not the right way to look yeah, at it. for sure. Right now, it's about $100 oil. Natural gas is 5 $6, yeah. so the prices are great. Yeah. Do you see the collective ego of downtown Rise in a scenario like this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, people are, uh, that's a good question. You know, I, I, th- I think there's all, it's just human nature, yeah. right? And some people have a bit firmer grasp of their ego than others do. <laughs> and the people that have a firmer grasp of their ego say, well, wait a minute, I'm, you know, there's, there's a bunch of exogenous forces. I didn't become the world's best CEO. Uh, you know, I was, I, I'll tell you a funny story. I won't, I won't, it's, it's, it's about a guy who I've known for a long time. And I've ended up being on his board for a while. And the truth was, he, he was a high flyer. And his stock, and these are both the right numbers, both $17. And then he released the uh, results of his winter drilling price years and years ago. And they weren't very good. And so the stock crashed to $8. And this guy was really despondent. And uh, so I took him out for a drink and I said, listen, here's the deal. When your stock was at $17, everyone was telling you you had 170 IQ. Now that it's at eight, everyone's telling you you got an 80 IQ. We both know your IQ is somewhere in between. We just don't know where. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to kind of, you know, it's, you're, you're never as good as your success. You're never as bad as your failures. And I think that's, but yeah, I know it's, uh, uh, people are feeling smarter and more successful. I mean, it's one of the things that, that, I think Alberta has to kind of get a grip on because it's why this province is misunderstood in Canada is there's, there is that bit of swagger and, and, you know, you have to, you have to accept that luck plays a part. Luck plays a part in everything, right? I mean, um, one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me was I happened to be a brunette Duckworth when Murray Edwards was here pretty famous energy name yeah and 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 murray and i kind of started around the same time and and i was the tax guy and he was the corporate guy on a bunch of small accounts and i got to know him and um he had been trading the stock market since his teens so i learned quite a bit about the stock market just hanging with him very lucky you know very lucky to have had exposure to what i think is one of the you know one of the real business geniuses I mean, that's luck right speaking of leaders and entrepreneurs you've seen a lot of leaders yeah successful business people yeah through the years do you, any stick out to you maybe alongside murray edwards maybe brett wilson or uh, clay uh, riddell yourself well <laughs> you could have stopped it uh, you could have stopped it <laughs> um you know, it's people that figure out where the, it, like, they figure out where the business is at, and they capitalize on it. Like you think of Brett. Brett started um, First Energy. Well, it started. That was the. He was right on the cusp of what became the junior oil and gas boom, and that was again by some of the same forces that created the trusts. So he was there. You know. He figured it out, him and Murray actually figured it out, and um, and they were there to capitalize it. So it's people that, you know, are kind of the right guy at the right time, just like Marcel Trombley was the right guy at the, at the right time. Um, another guy who probably is not as well known, but is Dave Johnson, who was the, the CEO of Progress. Well, he was there when the Montney was, you know, it was a little company. I was on the board. They were, I, I, I think they were looking for DeBolt gas at the time. And Dave said, why don't we deepen this? There's people having success in the money. Let's see what happens. And, you know, five years later, it was sold to Petros for $2.2 billion. So, you know, there's a guy who was at the right place at the right time, and he had the smarts to capitalize on it, right? Um, you know, the, 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 um, 
what's going on now, the Clearwater, you know, that's a big play in Western Canada. Well, a guy like Clayton Whitus, Ian Curry, you know, a couple of guys that were conventional guys, and they saw this potential for doing something a little different on the conventional reservoir. Their company, Spur, I, you know, I, I'm a small shareholder, but I'm sure it's got a three or four billion dollar market cap. I mean, it's private, but but I'm sure it's you know, if it went public tomorrow, it'd be worth a couple couple three four billion dollars. Right guy, right time. Sometimes you got the right guy, and it's the wrong time. And and then the other thing that that sort of the the flip side of that is guys that chase the same model but don't realize times have changed. And there's a lot of those people who kind of, and I won't go into the, the details of why, what made the junior oil and gas model work, but then times changed. It became times fully changed. And some guys chased the same, chased the same model and became the, the, the fly on the windshield, you know, that sort of thing, the bug on the windshield. So, you know, I, I, think, I think there are people that were the right guys at the right time and they realized it and they, and they capitalized it. And, and, you know, Edwards right there, um, Clayton Whitus right there, Dave Johnson right there, Brett, uh, Marcel Trombley right there. Um, you know, I'd have, to, I'd have to think about it, but, but yeah, guys that were kind of visionaries. How important do you think it is to go against the grain? I've read that that's one of the things that makes Murray Edwards really successful. Is he like buying up oil sands a few years ago? Yeah. Well, I think it's very important, but it's not just going against the grain. Like going against the grain is a principle that's kind of it's almost could easy. be smart, could yeah. be stupid, <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. Um, but it's sometimes you have to you have to cut through the prevailing wisdom to see if it has logical consistency. So you know, I mean, I remember a conversation I had with Murray over lunch uh, a few years ago, and we were talking about, um, you know, climate change and all the rest of it. And, and I said, well, Murray, you know, the way the market is trading C&Q right now, it's assuming that you will be out of business in 2035. You know, it's really just a 10% discount on the cash flow using Strip between now and 2035 and then you back it out in the debt and mm-hmm. all the rest of it. And that's the number, not that I'm brilliant enough to figure that out. Yeah. I saw that in the research report, yeah. but, but anyway, he looks at me, he says, you think we're going to be out of business in 2035? I said, no, I don't think so. He said, well, then I guess C&Q is a buy. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I guess it is. Yeah. You know, and that's what I mean. It's, it's, you sort of look at, you sort of look at what the prevailing wisdom is. You know, over the last few years, I've invested more and more in oil stocks as they've gone down because, frankly, I think the the, the optimism over the energy transition is wildly out of whack. And we're going to need oil and gas and, you know, probably to a certain extent coal, not that I've invested in coal, but oil and gas is going to be around a lot longer than what the talking heads seem to say because and and you know that is that's just a function of looking at where we are in capitalistic development you know you you i I won't bore you with that but but basically capitalism is 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 a movement forward and it's always predicated on growth and the reason that growth has to happen is because at any particular time the system is full of IOUs that can't be paid back unless things grow. So, you know, the best example is you think about a biotech company that raises $10 billion and invests it in research. Well, if they find nothing, those shares are worthless. And so you're always, it always has to grow. And if it doesn't grow, it collapses. It truly can't stand still. And, and so, you know, we're going to need energy to, to, to continue growth while technology catches up. And it's nowhere near catching up. So, so I'm thinking, okay, if, the, if, if C&Q, the market is saying C&Q is out of business in 2035, that's just a, you know, that's just a, a symbol of it. Then I'm thinking I'll bet the other way. I will bet 
that CNQ and TransCanada pipelines and all these other things will be around in 2035 because we'll still need the energy. So, you know, that that's like, yeah, is that going against the grain? Yeah, it's going against the prevailing wisdom, but it's sort of informed, right? You're, you're sort of thinking, okay, this is why I'm doing it. You know, you don't want to just jump off a cliff. <laughs> It's easy to be the contrarian in a certain regard, but it's also, it's hard to be the contrarian. And be hard right. to be, psychologically, it's really hard to be a contrarian. To be right. Yeah. yeah. Homo sapiens aren't wired that way. Yeah. 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 So it's, and that's why guys that are contrarians, um, you know, they have that sort of a mental strength to be a contrarian to say, yeah, you and everybody else says it's left. Yeah. I'm going to say it's right. And that takes a lot of that takes a lot of guts, right? <laughs> so, so I'd say, yeah, guys that are contrarian, like, yeah, Murray's got a lot of guts. He, he, uh, you know, his what made CNQ was was buying out Amico when oil was twelve bucks. Yeah, yeah, that made CNQ. I mean, wasn't the only thing, but it made CNQ, and that took a lot of guts, you know. The, uh, the Economist had five dollar oil on its cover, and, and so you have to look at that and say, "Is five dollar oil in 1999 a reasonable assumption?" Murray would say, "No." Okay, well then I'm going to buy this stuff. <laughs> is C and Q shutting down in 2035? Is that a reasonable assumption? No. Well, I'm going to buy this stuff. So anyway, kind of that's... like the uncommon common sense. It's sort of trying to look beyond the noise. I mean, that's the problem, right? We've got, it's like the news is going 24 hours a day and there's lots of noise and there's lots of outlets and there's, you know, there's the prevailing view. The problem with the prevailing view is the prevailing view from a trading strategy is ultimately everybody piles onto the prevailing view and the trade gets crowded and it has, that's the seeds of its own destruction right warren buffett's buying energy yeah i know exactly i i'm a i'm a warren buffett disciple really oh yeah me too i, I read his book and it makes sense to me that's and, awesome yeah no it's um you know i mean he's all about companies that produce cash yeah. and what's really f interesting right now on the way the oil industry i'm not saying it'll continue this way but the way the oil industry ran itself for the last 20 years, I would analogize it to a store. So the store sells a certain amount of its product, takes the revenue from that product, and borrows a bunch more money to fill a warehouse. <laughs> growth. Yeah, growth. With no idea what, the, what, what that product in the warehouse is going to be sold for and, and the timing and anything like that. And so... Who would want to invest? You know, if you look at Buffett, he'd say, why would I invest in something like that? Makes no sense. So now with this whole free cash flow model, the oil and gas companies are, are looking at it and saying, okay, we're going to sell a, a, an amount and we're going to take the portion of the revenue we get to restock our shelves. And then the rest is profit. And so that's why you have people like generalist investors starting to, to, to pay attention to the sector because the sector stopped being crazy. Hmm. And when you think about that store analogy, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> Who would run a store like that? Yeah. You know, yeah, like I'm going to sure. take my revenue and uh, I'm not going to pay my owners. I'm going to build a warehouse and fill it with stuff that I don't know when I can sell and at what price. Yeah, yeah. So, so who would want to invest in a store like that? <laughs> you know, so so it's like we're 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 it, the oil and gas industry. I mean, it's funny. People are saying, "Wow, they're not reinvesting," and blah 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 blah. The truth is, they've stopped being stupid. The 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 stupid behavior. That's what was causing the 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 you know, like when you think about it. If you use my if you use my warehouse analysis analogy. As more and more warehouses were built, of course the price is going to go down because you got to clear the inventory, you know. And so by the industry building more and more warehouses, we were it had the seeds of its own demise. Well, now by not building the warehouses and just restocking the shelves, you know, it's going to probably guarantee 
uh, you know, higher prices. Do you worry that the cycle is just going to continue though? That everyone's going to go out and drill a bunch again and it's just the same old thing? I don't thing? know, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think not for a while. Eventually, you know, it's all fear and greed at some point. Exactly. At some point, it probably turns. But right now, um, I think the world probably needs, like we're, we're, we're flat out. We've got prob. I read a report the other day which says uh, surplus uh, productive capacity worldwide is like about one and a half percent, and it's all heavy. Mm-hmm. It's all in Saudi Arabia and UAE. And, and so, you know, we should be investing more. And the climate movement has probably taken about five trillion dollars of investment that would otherwise be made and taken it out of the system. Uh, so that's that. So we're five trillion behind. Yeah. We're five trillion behind, and we're getting farther and farther behind. Um, so yeah, at some point we should be stepping on the gas. I think the problem is governments and NGOs are stepping on the brake. So you're going to, you know, it's going to be a car craning down the road with somebody saying, I should step on the gas a little bit and somebody else stepping on the brake at the same time. So, you know, I, th- I think we're going to have some, I think we'll have some energy instability here for a while um, until, until the prevailing narrative changes. And I don't think people will start drilling like crazy until the prevailing narrative changes. When will that happen? I have no idea, but I think there's there's a lot of institutional momentum behind the the, the narrative that that the oil and gas industry is a sunset business. I mean, you think about it. Um, a lot of people are describing oil and gas as uh, like cigarettes, tobacco. tobacco. Yeah, and so well, what do you do with tobacco companies? Well, tobacco companies aren't growing and. But there's a market, and it's probably shrinking, and people are dying. And uh, so what do they do? They pay out their excess cash. Well, they're applying that model to oil and gas, except the market is growing. <laughs> you know, the, the, yeah, the prevailing uh, thesis behind the tobacco is the market is shrinking. Well, it's growing. Tobacco? No, no. Oil and gas, yeah. it's growing. Yeah, exactly. And so you, you probably shouldn't apply that, but that is what's being applied. And so the capital markets are looking at oil and gas companies and saying, hey, we don't want you to reinvest your capital. And, and that's why you don't see any of the large companies significantly increasing their capital budget because their stock market, they, their stock would get slammed because the prevailing narrative is that you guys are tobacco. So it's, it's kind of interesting. And, and that, in and of itself will probably guarantee higher prices for a while until that prevailing narrative gets changed. The fear of peak demand is leading to the reality of peak supply. It's like saying going around yeah, right now. Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. For the short term anyways. Yeah, for the short term. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. My, uh, my daughter said to me, she's like 30, and she said, I'm really worried about Calgary being a ghost town. And I said, I said, sweetheart, when we see solar powered planes in the sky, that's when I'll start to worry. <laughs> you know, oil, and, oil and, and natural gas is ubiquitous. It's not just transportation fuel. It's plastics. It's fertilizer. It's medicine. It's, it's, like, it's like a lot of stuff that we use every day. And it's not going anywhere. There's no real substitutes for it. Uh, transportation is only like 30% of the uh, petroleum yeah. market. Yeah. And so so let's assume that you you take a third of that and electrify it. Well, a third of that, the electricity grid, you'd have to power a bunch of it by natural gas. But even that, you know, it doesn't really take take demand that far down. So... These are interesting times. I mean, I'm glad I'm alive to see it. It's an inflection point in the industry. And, um, you know, it's it's kind of a weird uh, inflection point in human history because if you look at, um, if you look at, say, uh, let's say 5,000 years ago. Okay, that's that's a blink of an eye in time. 
5,000 years ago, over 95% of the energy that was produced was used to produce the energy. Yes. Food, right? So 95% of what was produced went into producing the, the 95%. So now, what do we have? Well, I, I don't know the number, but it's under 10. 10% yeah. of the energy that is produced goes into producing the energy. And it's probably a lot less. And that other 90% fuels everything else. And that's why human progress has. Yeah. And so if you look at renewables, renewables start pushing the percentage of energy that's produced to produce the energy higher. And, and so every time that has been higher, human progress has gone backwards. And so it's, it's really interesting. It's a really interesting time. I'm, uh, you know, it's like, that's the beauty of human history. It's like the, um, Mark Twain said, said history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And <laughs> so that's, that's kind of cool. What's going on now. You've seen a lot of deals over the year. Like we're saying, maybe Murray Edwards buying oil sands in 1999. Have you seen any that? Any that have really created the most amount of wealth and built up the biggest companies? Any deals? You've seen tons of deals. Um, well, what creates the most value is where you hit things at inflection points, right? And uh, so, like, for example, um, for example, uh, uh, Progress being one of the first movers in the money created huge value. The early Clearwater players, Spur, creates you know c creates huge value. So those are the deals, the the initial land positions in the Montney, initial positions in the Clearwater, hitting hitting oil sands at the absolute inflection point when it was about ready to to take off. Those were those were huge deals, and there were there were yeah there was huge value created there. It's it's all timing. <laughs> it's it's it's. Then, you know, getting the next, being the early mover on the next big thing. It's a mature basin in Canada. Do you think that's still possible in terms of geology or is it different now? Is it? Well, you look at the Clearwater. Clearwater is going to be 100,000 barrels a day. And that's a play that five years ago didn't exist at all. It's a conventional play. Yeah, it's still possible. I mean, um, yeah, you look at you look at even the Montney. You could make an argument that the Montney is, you know, I'll give you the baseball analogies in the third or the fourth inning. There's still lots of value to be created. So yeah, it's you know it's catching inflection points. The earlier the better. But yeah, I think I think there's still there's still tremendous opportunities out there. Tremendous opportunities. What motivates you now? You don't really have to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the it's the fun of it it's the fun of it i uh like i uh i was kidding my wife i said she asked me the same question i said well i'm working for the salvation army these days working for a group of charities uh, you know at the end of the day i'm a, not a huge believer in you know um i i'm gonna leave most of it to to, to charity you know i'm just not a I don't have an excessive lifestyle. I don't want one. I'm, I'm one of these guys that thinks that, you know, at, at some point in time, the next thing you get actually detracts from your quality of life, doesn't add to it. It's mostly just fun. I'm, I like the intellectual process. I like the people. Like, you know, somebody like Rob, he's fun. You know, he's fun. He's a good guy. He's a good partner. You feel like you're in the foxhole together. It's just fun. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's just fun now. Do you, do you remember the day you realized you maybe didn't have to work anymore? <laughs> uh, it's funny, you know. It's like, funny Whoa. you should ask that question <laughs> because um, I probably blew through it long before I came to realize it. You know, I, I think the problem is, and there's, there's just something about growing up poor <laughs> that you always, it's, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a really good question. But I think that... Um, I think it's probably the point where I realized that work was not about financial security. It was more about identity. Yeah. 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 You know, when you like, 
you know, I got my first job when I was 14. I was delivering prescriptions on my bike. Yeah. So I've kind of been at it ever since. And um, it's just your identity. It's just what you do. You know, I, I think if I had uh, grown up as, uh, you know, Prince Charles's kid or whatever, you, or Queen Elizabeth's kid, you, you maybe get a better, a different sense of it. But mm-hmm. just, just working and being productive and doing something has just been, always been part of my life. Now you get to pick who you work with, kind of yeah, the companies exactly. you get that's involved That's the with. difference. Yeah, that's the difference. Yeah, you, you have to do less of the stuff you don't want to do yeah. and more of the stuff you do want to do. That's the biggest difference. Would you say that's how you pick your projects now is kind of just the people yeah, side of things? Very, very much so. It's, it's a combination of the project having interest to me and the people. Do you think $100 oil is here to stay? Is that impossible yeah, to say? It's here to stay for a while. I think, I think it's, it's here to stay. I, I, let me put it to you this way. I don't see anything that will stand in the way of hundred dollar oil. Even like, you know, <clears throat> today the, the, the stock market for, or the oil stocks are all crashing yeah. and it's because recession, you know, all recession, blah, blah, blah. The truth is that recession generally oil demand is fairly inelastic. So Let's assume recession cuts 3%. That's 3 million barrels. Okay, that's a lot. You only got 1 million barrels of, of excess supply. And do you think the Saudis and their OPEC allies are not going to cut production to maintain their revenue? Well, of course they will. Of course they will. They can cut their production by 5% and, and you know prevent a decline. So I think a recession probably doesn't doesn't affect the oil price. I, I think the, the climate activists are going to keep their foot on the brake as best as they can. Mm-hmm. That's going to prevent capital investment. I think oil and gas executives are, you know, now the market is controlled by, by generalist investors, and they're going to require that you only restock the shelves, you don't build the warehouse. So all those things to me, and, and I don't see any other technological change that's that's going to affect any of this. So, yeah, I mean, uh, my, my crystal ball is as, as cloudy as anyone's, but I, I can't see anything on the horizon that's going to change it. Up to this point, like you've had a very long, successful career, and you've been a lot of, involved in a lot of deals, met a lot of people, yeah. seen a lot of ups and downs in the energy industry. What's been the most exciting part of your career? Was it when the trusts were booming and the idea took you off? Know, I think probably the most exciting part of my career was meeting some of the people I worked with at various points and little deals. Like it's not there. There isn't an, an you know, like for example, I worked on Hibernia. I worked did, did some work on Hibernia. That was a very uninteresting thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was very bureaucratic and lots of government and stuff like that. I found that. You know, I could take that or leave it. Uh, working with a guy like my Marcel Trombley, you know, kind of a crazy guy. Yeah. And interesting <laughs> as all hell uh, for a bunch. I mean, you know, he, he, uh, yeah, I mean, I could tell you Marcel's story. You know? <laughs> but, but it's meeting some of these characters. Like you meet, like the oil and gas industry, there are just a lot of interesting, interesting yeah. characters. And, uh, and, uh, like lots of nice people. They've been, you know, I came out here in 1981, knew no one, lived in Forest Lawn with two guys from, uh, Canadian Forces Base Calgary, two medics from New Brunswick, one medic's girlfriend, and a guy I'd met in law school, five of us living in a four bedroom house in Forest Lawn next to a biker gang near the Max Bell Arena. So you start there and and people have been very generous, you know, like meeting guys like Harley Hotchkiss, classic, class, class guy. My partner, Jim Palmer here, one of the great legal entrepreneurs ever. Um, I've met some political people that are really kind of cool and interesting, like Paul Martin, not not very well thought of as a prime minister, but, a, you know, really smart, funny guy. Um, J.C. Anderson, Anderson Exploration, you know, late J.C. Anderson. I mean, yeah, well, I was, we were reminiscing about him with someone who knew him the other day. And 
one of uh, JC's lines, which typi- typified him, was he said, John, he said, life's like a dog sled race. If you ain't the lead dog, the scenery never changes. <laughs> so I just met some cool people, you know, and uh, Al Markin, there's another guy, cool, cool guy. And uh, yeah, so I just, just met a lot of cool people. And, uh, and uh, you know, people that don't take themselves like, like really smart, accomplished people that don't take themselves super seriously. I, I just... That's what I like. And so I'd say that's been much more significant to me than the dollar numbers that I've worked on. Like I said, some of the funnest deals were the smallest dollar amounts. Some of the most tedious things were some of the biggest. <laughs> well, not just that. Sometimes six are, yeah, again, you have to know yourself. I, I, I um, like I'm very bad at very long meetings. I, my mind wanders. And, and I don't find them very, I like things saying, here's the problem. We're going to do X, Y, and Z. Let's go like that. That's more fun for me. The, the, you know, the 20 person meeting that drags on for seven hours, it's less fun for me. What advice would you give to a young lawyer or entrepreneur nowadays starting out in energy in Canada or in general? Um, well, you know, one of the things I do is I um, I mentor at Haskane. I, I mentor at CCAL. And I was the Yaroslavsky Fellow at uh, at Haskane for a couple of years as well. And uh, so it's allowed me to have lots of access to people like yourself. And, you know, what I, what I generally tell people is do what you're interested in. And surround yourself with people that you like and who compliment you. And and I think those are the keys to, to success. And I guess the third aspect of it is keep your eye on the big picture. Because a lot of times, you know, what happens to us is much less a function of how good we are at what we do. And more a function of where we are in the scheme of things. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, it, it, it's funny, like around here, when business is booming, you know, when the economy is booming, people think they're smarter than they are. Yeah. And when it is not, they think they're dumber than they are. Hmm. And I said, you know, kind of get a grip on yourself. A, a lot of it is exogenous factors. Yeah. So. Or uh, in the words Nassim Taleb, it's a lot easier to give advice well, it's better to tell people what not to do. <laughs> exactly. 100%. 100%. What would you say not to do? Well, I mean, for me, the, the worst experiences I've ever had in business is when I picked the wrong partners. So um, don't, be, uh, don't be dazzled by the shiny object. Um, you know, it's... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes people that are, uh, you know, the, 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 there's almost a direct correlation between people that are flashy and uh, people that will get you in trouble because they're more style than substance. So, I mean, yeah, advice is don't get don't don't blur the distinction between style and substance. Substance wins the day long term. Do you go to the Berkshire meeting? I have never been to the Berkshire meeting, although I do read, I read his messages yeah. religiously. Yeah. The one I just love is the one about gold. And cause it kind of lines up with my view on gold. And I don't know if you ever read his message on gold. The book. big shiny object is sitting yeah, in yeah. a baseball field. <laughs> yeah. And all that. Yeah, yeah. Since I'm a baseball fan. And yeah. Just, yeah. And, and I mean, like he has a way of just cutting through the BS that I love, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, crypto or, or any of that stuff. I, I just, yeah. I mean, there's, um, there's like the fact he just emphasizes cash flow. Yeah. He emphasizes, I mean, there's a, a story, a famous, uh, famous, uh, lawyer, famous trial lawyer, Clarence Darrow, who defended the school teacher in the scopes trial. But anyway, he, he paid the bills by doing defense work for rich people from time to time. And, uh, and so he had gotten this socialite off on a murder charge, which she had apparently done. 
And so she was very dramatic and she was gushing over him after the trial. She says, oh, Mr. Darrow, Mr. Darrow, he says, how can I ever thank you? And he looks at her and says, Madam, since the Phoenicians invented money 9,000 years ago, there really is only one way. <laughs> <laughs> cash, so, right? Yeah, <laughs> cash, right? Cash, <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of, I kind of like that, you know. And, and don't, yeah, don't get, don't get fooled by the shiny object. He, Warren Buffett is very retail oriented, also. Like he releases all the reports on Saturdays, just so the retail can read them and yeah. whatnot. Yeah. Kind of like doing this. It's uh, this is about as retail as it gets when you're talking yeah, to people. And, and I, you know, I don't, I, I, you know, I got my theories right, and I, hopefully they're down to earth and. And at the end of the day, like so much of investing is is really just getting getting beyond the hype, right? And it's you know like if you, I, I, you know, you're too young, but the the dot com boom, you sort of looked at some of these valuations and you said, okay, well these people are you know this valuation is only justified if you have a hundred percent growth for fifty years. Yeah. By that point, you've covered the world in whatever this product is several times over. Yeah. How can you? How can how can that be? Mm-hmm. And you know, there's there's the emperor has no clothes quality <laughs> to all of this. And so you have to really ask yourself, saying, what's the premise that I'm buying this stock over? Like, you know, when I when I buy buy stocks, and I I do, you know, I'm I'm probably that's one of my fun things to do is I always have a theory. I always have a premise. And my premise is never, I'm buying it because it's going up. It always, I always have to say, really, you know, and this is the Warren Buffett aspect of it, I'm owning a fractional interest in this business. Do I want to own this business? Yeah. And uh, so, uh, yeah, no, I, I, like I'm a, I'm a fan of his. It's, it's kind of interesting, um, if you're uh, if you look at at the world now, one of the things that's probably wrong with it is the size of the financial sector in in uh, as in proportion to the productive sector. Uh, I think it was J.P. Morgan that said uh, finance is supposed to be the handmaiden of industry, which is yeah, finance is supposed to derive the capital to make stuff. And now it's a casino. And that's what's really weird about everything that's going on because some things just make no sense. And again, coming back to your contrarianness, it takes, it takes, some, it takes some gumption to say, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Why, why is C&Q down to $63 today? You know, that's a, almost a 5% yield. And it's got a 50-year reserve life and blah, 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 blah. And Marie Edwards is a genius. Why, you know, what, why is the market trading this down to a 5% yield? I don't get it. And so you have to ask yourself that. You say, what is, what is the premise behind what this stock's trading at? Both positively and negatively, you know. And if you, if you think the market has kind of got the wrong premise, then you're then it's time to either buy or sell or not buy, I guess, or not sell. Speaking of productivity and true entrepreneurs making, creating value. Yeah. How often do you see that truly in maybe Calgary, Western Canada versus just that kind of shuffling, shuffling. Exactly. I mean, the whole junior oil and gas sector was all about shuffling. It was really, and the guys that made money were the lawyers and the investment bankers and the brokers. And I mean, that's why that junior market doesn't exist because the investors finally figured it out. It was a shell game, right? And so that was 100% that. There was virtually no value created. In the juniors? In the juniors. Virtually no value. I mean, because you looked at it and you'd say, okay, this company, um, it's going to grow its production by buying something else. Well, how's that value created? (laughs) Unless you steal it and you can't. It's an efficient market, so there's no value creation. They drill it up sometimes, though, wouldn't they? But mostly it was was, uh, very mature assets. So the drilling was really 
bumping up against the law of diminishing returns. It was stuff that shouldn't have been drilled. The drilling was acceleration. So the drilling itself was overcapitalizing the asset. Yeah. I mean, that's where, um, you know, the, the original, like the original junior model was like everything else. It was a good idea that was taken to an extreme. Right. Yeah. So the first guys to do the drilling to accelerate production were, uh, you know, Renaissance and, and, and uh, C&Q, the original C&Q. And they were all, they were both guys, Clayton Whitus and Al Mark, and were disciples of this guy named Bob Dixon at Merlin Exploration, right? Yeah. And so what they were doing was they were saying, well, wait a minute. People have been producing stuff slowly because they expected the price to go up, right? So the barrel in the ground is worth more tomorrow than it is today. What they figured out was, um, we're probably in a period of, of stagnant oil prices. So a dollar today is worth a dollar today, and it's probably worth more than than holding off on producing this. So, so you know, originally what they were, it was a lot of it was acceleration, acceleration of cash flow. And at first it created value because these assets were underexploited and acceleration made sense. But then... Yet everybody doing it, and they were paying higher and higher prices for the properties, which could then be accelerated. Well, the higher you pay the price, the, the less of that economic rent you're capturing by accelerating. So, yeah, it was a good idea that 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 went way, way too far, and then the junior sector kind of collapsed. It collapsed after the see see what was happening was the trust allowed the overcapitalization to work. Yeah, because they'd buy them all at, at a cash flow multiple. And so you had an arbitrage that, that, that kept going. But after that was, you know, you could see the writing on the wall. As so soon as, like, oh, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I mean, he could see the writing on the wall. That's, you know, if, if there's a, uh, if there's a piece of business advice to take, <laughs> it's look for the writing on the wall. Right. So the the true productivity was there, but it yeah, it's all a question of what you pay for it. Right, you've seen it, but it's rare. The you mean real value creation? Yeah. Well, now you got some real value creation. It's, it's funny because now without this overcapitalization, it goes back to fundamentals. You have to make it work. <laughs> yeah, you gotta. I mean, one of the things that that. Um, allowed the junior sector to prosper was you had a bunch of specialist energy investors who would look at, you know, growth per share and things like that and reserves per share and all this stuff. A lot of which made no sense economically. Now you got generalists who's saying, hey, look at I'm comparing this to a manufacturing. I'm comparing this. And so now you've got, I mean, I was talking to a fund manager and he said, now I, I'd say, well, okay, this manufacturing has a free cash flow yield of 12 or 8 in this case. And by the way, your company has a free cash flow yield of 20. Yeah. And he said, I can't find 20 anywhere in my <laughs> portfolio, so I'm buying your stock. And maybe, I'll, maybe I will bid it up to 18 cash flow yield or 16 or whatever. But, but you actually have real cash flow being real... Real, you know, you have to think about value in a different way. Like, value isn't necessarily building reserve value. It's harvesting what you got and cash flow. And then, you know, replacing what you've produced as cheaply as possible. And then keeping, you know, giving your, giving your owners the rest. And, and, you know, is that value being created? Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe we're back in a cycle of that sort of business model then. Yeah, I think, well, we are for a while. You look at everybody in town, everyone's paying down debt. Yeah. Um, and starting to pay dividends. I mean, you looked at uh, Pine Cliff run by uh, 
run by a really good guy, a friend of mine, Phil. Phil was on the podcast. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, Phil's a great guy. Yeah. Really and, good guy. Uh, and, you know, he's, I mean, that company was on the ropes. Yeah. I mean, they were borrowing from their shareholders. They did a bond issue to their shareholders. Well, now he's debt free. He did a press release the other day. He's debt free and he's starting to pay a dividend. Good for Phil. Yeah. Big Buffett fan. Yeah. It, it's the same thing, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so Phil has kind of figured it out. That And is Phil creating value? I would argue, sure he is. He's not drilling, not very much. He's not making any discoveries, but his shareholders are making money. You know, right. Another one of these recovered lawyers. <laughs> you know, yeah. Phil's, Phil's a lawyer. Right? <laughs> yeah. A lot of lawyers. Yeah. Hmm. How many people do you think get that in the, uh, is in it a small crowd? Yeah. Very few. It's a lot of it is it's, it's trend following. And so the reason that people like just, just in the same way that everybody in the junior model did this acceleration thing. Now the, the flavor of the month is this other model, which is the Buffett model. They're following it because the market's requiring them to follow it. And if they don't follow it, their stock price goes down. But as far as, you know, sort of intellectually understanding it, I, I, I don't think there's a huge number of people that do. You know, it's a bell curve, right? It's a bell curve. Yeah. It's, yeah. But the, yeah, there, hmm. I mean, that's the cool thing in Calgary. It's not everyone is super smart, but the people that are smart are pretty smart. Yeah. You know, pretty smart businessmen and figuring out where they're, you know, where the next opportunity is. That's a great conversation. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. That was fun. Hey, thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. If you like what you heard, check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows. Until next time, happy coffee drinking. <laughs>